Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar series. And today we're, we're talking about the consumer goods retailing market in Australia. Uh, my name's Simon Cathro, and to my left and to your right is Andrew Blundell. We're both the um, principals of Cathro and Partners. Um, and today we're going to give a, an insolvency and restructuring perspective on, uh, on this market sector of the retail market. Um, and uh, you know, we're pleased that we've got uh, people turning up and listening to us and uh, we'll touch on what the current market uh, anticipates to look like over the next coming years, um, what the market factors driving this sector look like, what are the challenges and um, uh, hurdles that they need to encounter and what are the, some of the elements that are going to shape the future of the retailer and finally, just talking about um, a turnaround process uh, for uh, for the retail for a retailer in this sector. Uh, and Andrew will, will talk a bit about Napoleon Purtis and what we did during that 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 uh, voluntary administration. And I'll finish off with some some more discussion around some of the the life cycle and the risk cycle of a business and and, and how 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 retailers and uh, people should should, should uh, approach things when they are falling into uh, into a financial underperforming business. So over to you, Andrew. I'll, I'll let you kick it off and uh, and start the presentation. Thanks, Simon, and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for attending today. It's uh, always good to be able to work through some of these uh, issues with our client base and our referrer base. And yeah, there's some interesting stuff here that uh, the team's put together in relation to white paper um, which we're going to step through now. So if we just look at um, the market overall, it, obviously 2023 is another year of I guess disruption overall. There's yeah. what's happening economically, globally, we've obviously we've talked about that nauseam, we've had the COVID issues, we've come out of those now and now we've got inflation, interest rate rises, all of those things that are impacting consumers from a just from a basic level. Um, in the budget we've had some tax wind backs that uh, was set up by the previous government. So. Exactly and, and obviously they're trumpeting the, the, the surplus side of things and, and obviously they're giving more money to, to job seekers under the, um, the arrangements that have been announced in the budget even though there is a, a surplus. So I think there's still going to be some more inflationary pressures on the back of those increased handouts for want of a better word um, and but also at the same time um, the, the the pressure around interest interest rates is only really just starting to run through the market at the moment and even myself personally I'm starting to think about okay well my uh, my loan's gone up two and a half thousand dollars a month what am I cutting back on and the first thing I'm personally going to be looking at is do I need a new pair of shoes do I need that um, new pair of headphones from JB Hi-Fi. Those are the things that are obviously just um, on my own mind, let alone other people. And, and I think that's um, really setting the scene for the balance of 2023 going into 2024. So we look at the market overall. Um, it's quite obviously sizable in that there's $221.7 billion worth of goods that are uh, purchased each year. And, and it, on the back of our disposable incomes going down, um, the 4% decline here, even though we've, the, obviously it's quite a sizable number there, almost 600 billion. Um, that, all those pressures we spoke about just previously, uh, again, just have to have an impact in terms of the discretionary spend area. And, and going forward, that doesn't look like it's gonna be easing anytime soon. No, and I think, I think one of the things that's hard to predict is that we've all, been uh, surprised by the, the frequency of the interest rate rises mm -hmm. um, and the speed with which the interest rates have increased. Um, so some of this information, even as we present it, uh, may potentially be uh, superseded by uh, revised numbers because uh, the change, change in discretionary spend and the reduction in the discretionary spend is, is accelerating. And so yeah. in that sense, you know, will uh, real household income actually increase, um, and you know they, you talk about 1.3% uh, to 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 221 billion um, by 2026. Will that actually shrink even further mm. as that discretionary spend becomes 
a lot less. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I mean, it's crystal ball stuff, right? And it's something that we've always seemed to be contending with, particularly over the last few years. So that's that's the I guess the overall picture. If we look at um, consumer goods, there's really three different areas there that we can break it down into. Um, oh, sorry, that's going to be the next part. Uh, in terms of the key trends at the moment, um, look, there's there's a few um, issues that are broadly affecting not just this sector, but uh, the overall discretionary spend sector in, uh, in, in Australia and globally. And obviously technological advances are something we talk about quite frequently. Um, we've had uh, the change to the online model that we were forced to do in COVID, which obviously is, is ex exacerbating and extending now. Um, people have seen that you don't have to physically go into stores to buy things these days. You've got Amazon who've rolled out their one day delivery, which is obviously something that um, I'm utilising quite frequently. I know you are too. Yeah. Um, the profitability in those businesses uh, is obviously for people that are, are moving and have migrated into that online space is, is increasing because of the decreased overheads that they're obviously um, able to to achieve by not having as many people employed directly at uh, in a retail space and, and obviously not having to have um, retail premises in high traffic areas in the cities uh, around the space so there's obviously some um, some cost savings there and if you look at um, the way that those things are being marketed too the, there's, there's a multi-channel approach or an omni-channel approach and whilst um, the omni-channel approach and for those that are on the webinar that don't understand what that is. That's effectively looking at every single way that you can potentially market a product, whether it be in-store retail, whether it be via direct mail out of someone dropping something in your mailbox or email, or um, obviously a lot of the um, social media influencing nowadays is another way that those, um, those uh, brands are reaching their potential customers. So rather than that being just an overall scattergun approach in terms of the omni-channel side of things, people are getting more targeted and specifically using the Kim Kardashians of the world and, the, and, and using that as a specific um, channel for which they are there re then reaching their um, clientele and, and obviously focusing on those particular areas. Um, and the people that uh, are doing that uh, are the ones that are becoming more successful in terms of um, their overall business. And in terms of um, some things that are happening uh, overall from a, from a precious perspective, um, the fact that those people have migrated their business to a more online focused presence, um, it's allowing them to apply discounts that are still um, achieving profitability for the business overall, but that's obviously putting pressure on the people that haven't migrated into that space and are still relying on the bricks and mortar approach. So they're really the things that um, that have seemed to be coming through um, over the last year or two in terms of the emerging trends. If I can add to that, I think we're not seeing anything significantly different to what we've seen in terms of changing shopping behaviours over the number of years. You know, COVID obviously disrupted that process. It accelerated certain things like online shopping and took it from 10% up to 15% very quickly when it had actually slowed somewhat before that to a to 1% to 2% increase on a year-on-year -year basis. But um, I think that what sticks in my mind is it's about convenience and 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 what what that the customer wants. So, the, you know, who's your customer segment? Um, and, and understanding what that customer's behaviours are with regards to to selling product, you know, some of, you know, if you're selling to a to a customer base that is not uh, inclined to, to be online, you know, usually you attribute that to older, older an older generation, mm -hmm. then then the bricks and mortar uh, store would be a better format. Um, but then there, then there'll be certain products that people will want to actually, actually physically touch and physically visualise mm. before they make the decision to actually buy the goods. But particularly for this for, for this sector, I think it has a you know, the online presence is certainly growing and becoming a lot more relevant. I think a lot of the um, the the people in that space are you're right, Simon. In that people are still wanting to touch and feel things that that they're buying in this particular area. So. 
in terms of the omni-channel, multi-channel approach, a lot of the people that I've seen that have been more successful in that area have had some sort of flagship store where you can actually go and touch and feel those yeah. things. But they're also, um, in terms of the order process, trying to automate that via online. So yes, you can go in and you can try on your jacket or you can try on your pair of pants, but at the same time, um, there might be every single size there and they're pushing you to then go on order yeah. online. So yeah, there's that, that, that more targeted approach that seems to be um, coming through in, in that particular space. Just in terms of alluding to the three separate areas, um, there's a household goods side of things, there's a um, retail footwear and accessories side of things, which we'll jump into in a second, and we've obviously have segmented the market on those particular areas. So if we look at the household goods section, it accounts for 38.5% of the Australian retail market and includes furniture, computers, hardware, housewares, um, appliances, and even building supplies for the Bunnings side of things. That, that segment has had quite a bit of growth um, through the COVID period for obvious reasons. We weren't able to travel. We're in a position where we're fixing our houses rather than going to Hamilton Island on holidays. Um, the technological, technological advances that were required to implement in terms of working from home and that there's obviously a lot more computers that have been purchased and the associated accessories that go with it. Um, and then in terms of, um, as I've alluded to, the, the home-based technology side of things is expanding as well. So your Google Home systems, your, your lights that turn on when you walk in your door, hey Google, I'm home, those types of things are, are, are experiencing and have continued and will continue to experience a bump in terms of uh, demand from that side of things. And, and that's again an emerging trend, not just here but internationally. We look at the clothing, footwear and personal accessory space, that makes up 27.9% of the market. Uh, again, um, that area has benefited extremely well from the online side of things if people have been able to pivot quickly. And as you alluded to earlier, we can talk about Napoleon Purtis and some of the issues that they had because the pivoting side of things, even though it was a year or two ago, um, had started to gain momentum there and it was really a, really a, um, a circumstance where that pivot wasn't able to occur quick enough for us to, for them to get to a point where they were uh, they were able to take advantage of it. Look, for me, I mean, this is one of the areas I believe are going to be hardest hit. Um, it's probably the space where if there is a reduction in discretionary spend by customers, this is one area that they may look to cut back on their spending. Um, you know, clothing footwear, you know, historically hasn't had a huge price increase over the over you know, over the long term. Um, so, so I think what we will start to see here is people just choosing not to do that. I think the other thing too is that everything that has been spent during the COVID period, which was also propped up by government handouts, um, people now that need it. Uh, that need to, 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 to do the general replacement because they did a lot of that replacement or, or, or additional purchasing during that period and now they're probably this, they're probably sufficiently stocked with the products they want. So yeah. I, I see that this is an area where, you know, if you do have clients in, in, in this space, is to watch and see what the trends look like. And then certainly some of the conversations that we've had in recent uh, months um, with, with, with particular referring accountants and lawyers is, is that some of their clients that, uh, that play in that space have seen a big drop in the sales um, uh, for the sector. So yeah, that's, our, that's our view, um, is that this will be a sector that uh, is, is one to watch because um, yeah, our view is that, you know, and, the, and as, as Andrew alluded to early on, you know, the interest rate rises, it doesn't mean tomorrow you run out of money. It means six months later at time, you start to tighten the belt, you, start, you know, people come off fixed loans, people, uh, people have savings that they they use to spend on it, and uh, and then and then then they have to start to tighten their, their spending habits. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, just in terms of that, again, we couldn't we we're cooped up in houses. We had to find other ways to to I guess express our uh, things that we wanted to do or, or to get out of the boredom of being in our houses day to day. So a lot of people mm. bought that extra pair of shoes or. Or bought that new game for their children to 
obviously um, to play it or keep them occupied as part of that process. So yeah, I think you're right, it, it will be. And like you said, we've been speaking to some people who have seen that drop off just simply because of the fact that life's kind of come back to a bit of normality and those things have already been purchased. And the third area just encompasses everything else, which is the other consumer goods section. And it obviously uh, accounts for um, the balance being 33.6% of the market. Um, there's obviously not just um, changes from a, from an online perspective, but just the, the changes in um, the way that, that people are absorbing information these days is having a, a very big impact on the physical newspaper side of things and the physical book side of things because, again, you've got an Amazon Kindle or you've got your iPhone where you can absorb and, and um, obtain that information without having to go to the, the corner shop and buy your $2.50 Sunday yeah, delivery. I mean, if you look at the retailers that specialise in this sector uh, uh, segment, and that is you know, news agencies, um, bookstores, you don't see as many of them today as what you used to five or six years ago. I don't see this, this segment, uh, I see this segment continuing to adjust, continuing to see uh, I suppose retailers either merge into something else and offer something more di different. Um, you know, some of the news agents now they're, they're really quite stocked in, you know, presents and, and different types of products. So uh, it's it's not a sector that has been adversely ch has been changed as a result of COVID. It's just a, a sector that's going through that slow change in I suppose shrinkage that it's 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 experienced as a result of the online and changing consumer behaviors. Um, so it, it's I don't see it as being too much of a difference. I, I think the acceleration of people buying online from 10 to 15 percent would have had a would have started to impact this sector as well. Um, but we are seeing people like you know the mastheads and newspapers really run very effective online. Um, New, new, uh, news articles and, and app, apps that, that you can access it and read the, the news you know, you know, immediately and that's been there for some time now so we're not seeing too much change in recent recent time for this for, for this segment. So they're really starting to pick, try and figure out ways of monetizing it because of the yeah. pressures that are happening in, in terms of the physical product side of things and yeah, I've even noticed myself I read the Sydney Morning Herald religiously every day and, um, the articles that I had access to that I didn't have to pay for previously and now shrinking. So, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that um, is going to continue to change uh, just because of the way that the structure of that industry has been going. So, Simon's going to look at the current market performance and some future considerations here in relation to the space. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So, <laughs> This sort of is just repeating certain things that we've already mentioned earlier in the webinar, but um, what is obvious here is this retailing segment is growing at a much slower pace than the overall economy. Um, the average profit margins of, uh, have fallen over the past five years and they continue to, decl to decline. I think with the with, with issue, things like the interest rate rises, a, a reduction in discretionary spending, you're going to see probably a shift from a focus uh, more on revenue. Um, so you'll see price competition, you'll see some reduction in, in, the, in the pricing and, and even just as recently, I was observing you know, on the weekend when I was working, working, walking through the, the shopping centre, you know, pricing on certain, some of these products there was a lot of reductions in pricing that I'd actually never ever seen before. So you you will see some pretty pretty good pricing at the moment, simply because the the, the spend by the, the typical customer has reduced. Um, now, you know, the second point, there's also the catch up in the tourism and travel space. Now we've probably seen a fair bit of that play out in the last 12 months because travel has been returned to normal for some time now. Um, the, 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 the airlines are getting their planes back online whilst it takes time to, to get the, to get those planes restarted and out of the, was it the desert? It the Mojave Desert. Mojave yeah. Desert or something. But so, so you'll see the, re, the travel industry is, is still fairly, very healthy at the moment. But will that start to slow down over the next 12 to 18 months? Well, the thing that I'm seeing there too, just I travel quite a bit, the, the pricing of airfares at the moment is astronomical. It's astronomical, and 
obviously that's feeding into the inflation side of things too. And but yeah. again, it's almost perpetually so. And, and if the customer is choosing to do that, mm. then the you know, other industries are going to suffer. That's right. And so this is one segment that we think will, will be impacted by that. Um, yeah, the, the physical retail establishments will continue to decline over the 10 years. Um, you know, those strong shopping centres like Westfield Centre Group and, uh, uh, you know, they're adapting and they're changing and, and, and not seeing too much by way of, um, you know, uh, empty stores. They've, they've been able to, there was a period there where you saw a lot of empty stores, but they've been able to change that and get other, others in there. Maybe the, 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 the average floor space for, the, for, for their existing current clients are, are bigger. And so you're seeing bigger store formats for, for those that are staying within the shopping centre. You can still see that. I mean, from our side of things, I was speaking to someone yesterday and uh, they're negotiating with, uh, I can't, I won't mention names, but a large um, shopping centre owner around um, changes the term uh, of their lease and they're in a position where they're looking to hand back the keys at the moment. And the behaviour in terms of that space has definitely changed uh, in terms of, okay, well, yeah, you've had the COVID hangover, we've supported you through that, that's it. We're, yeah. we're going to go and continue like we ordinarily would these days. So I think you're right, there's going to be some more uh, more flow through in that space yeah. as well. Um, and look, the final point, businesses are anticipating to close those underperforming stores. Again, that's not nothing new there, that's something that's always been there for, for a long period of time. You know, but to put it into perspective, there's 140,000 retail establishments that contrib contributes to 10.7% of all employment and 4.1% and of the country's GDP. It's a big seg seg sector of, of the economy. So it's something that's important to the economy. Um, but again, we will see those changes as we mentioned. Well, I think if you think about it, the next or well, the biggest sector in the economy is the construction industry, right? Yeah. And we've seen everything that's happened in that space. Yeah. This, I guess that, I mean, we referred to previously in, in other podcasts and webinars, but that was really the canary in the coal mine for our economy overall because it was larger in terms of employment, it was larger in terms of contribution to GDP. The retail sector is probably number three when it comes to that side of things. and. We're already starting to see the impacts of that, and we'll get into that in a minute. But I mean, it's construction, retail. What next? Yeah, I think it's again. Um, whilst we're not seeing a lot in terms of an avalanche of closures, there's definitely been a, an impact on on businesses already. Every sector goes through a cycle. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, we have seen the construction sector have a correction. The question now is. Retail will it suffer a correction, or will it just suffer a slower, a slower, uh, or just a slower downturn? Yeah. Um, certainly, I think if if retailers are in this sector, they they must be expecting that there'll be a slowdown because there is a reduction in the discretionary spend. Yeah, exactly. So just on the market drivers, um, look, this is again sort of just supporting some of our earlier comments, but like re real household disposable income. Uh, that just has a direct impact on demand. Um, so consumers with higher household savings have more money to spend, and that's when you'll see uh, you know, this retail sector in, in improve. Um, what, what we have to highlight here is some of the things that are really going to impact re real household income. You know, as we said earlier, the tax incentive that was there is now being removed, that, that, that was being phased out, that was always being phased out. Um, interest rate rises, you know, the general view here is we've still got a few more to go um, and that's not finished. Cost of living, I think we all can say uh, that, that definitely has increased quite a bit. Um, and, you know, are we are we starting to see the early signs of uh, price competition? So will we see the stronger players and potentially the more profitable players because they run their businesses more efficiently, squeeze out those less, less profitable and less efficient businesses because of the price competition that's that's probably will ensure over the next, you know, at least 12 to 18 months. Well, it's the same in the scale, right? These bigger players, they've got the balance sheets to be able to support those yeah. reductions and that's just going to be... Well, they've probably, they've probably got better rent, rent agreements. So, look, whether, whether they're large retail uh, chains or whether they're, they're very well-run retail stores or mm. businesses, 
it, it comes down to the strength of the way that management runs the business. And this is very key. I mean, one of the things that we see as insolvency and restructuring uh, professionals is that the majority of, of companies that fail is caused by poor management. So the strong management skills that these retail uh, businesses will have, you know, th those, those retailers that have strong management, then they're the ones that are going to perform the best uh, in a difficult environment. Mm. And look, the final one is the CPA, uh, CPI. I mean, the performance of this division, uh, subdivision is impacted by the changes in the trade weighted index. Um, you know, the Australian dollar, I think, is around about 70 cents or something yeah, as, yes. as of sort of today. Um, so we're still seeing, uh, it's, historically, it's probably sat around that, 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 that over the last 40 or 50 years, but certainly in recent decades, you know, it's been up around the 80 and higher. Yeah. Um, so again, we're going to see more expensive products come in as a result of the, uh, the higher, uh, the lower dollar. Yeah. Um, just on current observations, um, I, I think, uh, again, to add to some of the earlier comments, um, you know, we've, we've mentioned their, their growth being at a slower pace. Some of the, some of the examples here that of recent times is Easy Buy, Alice McCall, Booze Bud, Sneaker Boy, of course, we did Napoleon Purtis a few years ago, uh, Sea Folly, uh, I noticed Sea Folly is up for sale again, um, and Kiki K. Um, you know, these retailers are examples of businesses that have collapsed over the recent time. Um, will we see similar retailers in the future start to uh, you know, experience the same um, outcome as what these businesses have suffered from? Um, I think that's where it's very important and when we touch on the, on the point around turnaround and restructuring, it's very important now that those retailers that, that can identify where their areas of improvement and are needed, uh, are working on them and working on them as quickly as possible. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, there's obviously a whole heap of overlays that come with that too. If we look at those examples that are on the screen, there's a number of those businesses that were effectively online retailers or providing some sort of expedited service. You had the milk run people, whilst they haven't been in an insolvency position, they've closed shop because yeah. they've obviously raised a lot of capital and, and They've figured that the scale of Australia is, and the size of the market isn't going to support the models that they're after in terms of the, the size of the well, orders. Are it's, it's a move back to traditional investment um, methodologies, and that is about profit. Yes. Okay, we, we've seen a lot of businesses, and not so much in this sector, but certainly in the technology space, where they've been able to easily raise, raise capital on the back of a, a, a promise that they will one day be profitable. These days, it's an absolute expectation. And there's a time frame, you know, are you turning, becoming profitable in the next 12 to 18 to 12 months to 24 months? Or, you know, um, you know, is your story strong enough to, 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 that the investors will say, yeah, I'm happy to sit and wait for it, for it to turn, a, uh, turn profit you know, after five years? Mm -hmm. I think it's a much tougher market than it is. That, that certainly impacts this, this sector as well. Absolutely. If we just look at some of the characteristics of, this is really applicable to most businesses, but specifically in a retail environment, um, there's, a, there's a whole range of, of levers that you can look at and um, make amendments to in terms of um, if a business is in a position where it's be, you know, starting to become distressed. And, and there, these are the levers that you can look to, to, to move around to try and help with um, an effective turnery and, and we'll get into that process in a minute and we'll talk about a few of the things that we experience specifically on the Napoleon Purtis size up side of things but if you look at um, the size of location what markets the business is in what channels if it's an omni-channel approach if it's a multi-channel approach is it targeted all of those levers in that space obviously um, provide some sort of impetus in terms of the volume of sales that they're achieving. Um, as I alluded to earlier in the um, in the conversation, we a lot of these more successful businesses, rather than having a scattergun approach where they try and reach every single market by every different means, then being more targeted in terms of okay, we'll we'll get Kim Kardashian to put up an Instagram post and there'll be some sort of discount code that's attached to it and we can automatically see 
the benefit of that because our sale will, will spike at that point. And by segmenting themselves and being more efficient in terms of their approach to the people that they're, they're trying to reach as customers, that, that's a lever that can have an automatic impact on volume. And that's something that if we're looking at a turnaround so circumstance, we'd be thinking about what, what areas those people are in and, and how we can um, be more efficient and, and obviously more uh, effectively more profitable by, by being specific about targeting those those particular areas and the other things we look at are obviously locations again if we just go back to the bricks and mortar side of things we've got 50 locations we, we do a, in a calculation in terms of the profitability of those locations so these guys are making money that's great we'll keep them going these guys are suffering and have been for the last six months do we do we chop that off and, and move on and again that, that that's going to add um, cash flow straight into the bottom line because you're you're obviously not funding that loss-making store. So uh, there's a couple of examples there just in terms of that particular area that you can look at to, to obviously um, move the, the deck chairs around to try and get to a point where the business is back to some level of profitability. Mm. Then you can look at the supply chain side of things. Do we have a multitude of people that we're relying on there? Can we look at renegotiating contracts? The products and services, do we have 50 different products and of that 50 different products, the top 10 are the ones that really make our money on that, if we think about the 80-20 rule. Um, Just with the supply chain, I mean logistics is obviously important mm -hmm. um, and you know a recent uh, assignment that I did, um, the, the business was smart enough to realise that their transport logistic operator, which was Scotts, um, was 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 not servicing them properly. Um, and whilst they weren't aware of the insolvency issues that were about to happen, they were very across the performance of Scotts. Mm. I mean, the performance had dropped dropped off quite a bit. So I I think the I think the lesson learned from that experience was that be very focused very tough on your supply chain um, providers um, because if they're not performing it could be that they've got solvency issues mm. and, um, and and they're not uh, their management is not strong to deal with the with the challenges that they have to face yeah. so it, you know that's one of the things that you know a retail business should be should be concentrating on yeah absolutely um, you've got workforce management processes there Obviously, overheads in terms of headcount is something that um, a lot of people look to quite quickly in terms of trying to, to decrease spend. Um, but people have to be cognizant that, that that's not necessarily going to give you a, a stra uh, an immediate decrease because there's redundancy costs and there's obviously the uh, associated um, add-ons that go with working through that restructuring of, of a headcount process. So. Um, whilst it's something that, that often gets uh, used, it's just not something that may automatically give you that that straightaway cash flow reprieve. Um, processes and systems, again, efficiencies is something that all good businesses should be looking at in terms of their process. I know um, if we're looking at the implementation of more technological systems that again um, will potentially lead to a, regi a reduced headcount, which obviously then over time gives you some some cash flow benefit. That's something that's, uh, that's there. And I think the other thing to add to that is, is knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the data analytics, the, the data input and understanding your customer, mm -hmm. your customer's behaviour, that can all often be captured by, by using the data that you have. And so the data such as who is your customer base, what 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 what's the sales break up between your online platform to your bricks and mortars? Yep. Where's your highest and best performing product? Um, what's your most profitable product? Right. Mm. Um, you know, it's 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 good to have a product that's moving very quickly, but if it's actually not that profitable, uh, your efforts to make it make your business into a profitable business is all, is that much harder. Absolutely. If I'm, if I'm only making ten cents per garment. When I'm selling it, but if I, I, I and, and my, another garment's making me ten dollars, mm. well, I have to I have to sell a hundred of these ten cent garments to, to make the same money here. And it may, it may be better that you take a position and say, hey, I'm going to have less revenue, but 
but the profit on that revenue is, is going to be much stronger. Again, very hard in this market when you, we're looking at discretionary spend and that expectation that there will be strong price competition and, and, and you, have to, you have to balance it. Absolutely, and obviously that ties into the strategic position. Do you, yeah. Are you a high, a high value retailer? Are you a low value retailer? Are you stuck in the middle? That middle space is really, really difficult to be profitable in because you're not the cost leader and you're not the Louis Vuitton. And that, again, if you, these businesses need to be looking at their strategic position and, and picking one or the other rather than yeah. trying to sit in the middle of the road. And that middle segment will be the one experiencing the most difficulty. Absolutely. Because you've got the premium brands and the, and the low cost brands, which, which tend to, to perform more consistently yeah. um, and, and tend to actually positively get impact, uh, impacted by changes in, in spending habits. Absolutely, absolutely. So we just look around, if we're thinking about a turnaround process overall, um, and I'm going to use Napoleon Purtis as an example here because something that Simon and I were intimately involved in in terms of the retail space, there, there's a whole process that it goes into thinking about how to work towards turning around a business. Mm -hmm. And it may not necessarily be in a formal appointment that Simon and I get involved in, in this circumstance there was, but a lot of it can be done behind the scenes with the engagement of management. Like you alluded to earlier, Simon, it's when management takes their eye off the ball in terms of the pivoting nature of their business and moving with the way that the industry's moving, that businesses get into a position where they become distressed. So if we're thinking about it just from an overall um, perspective, what we want to look at in the first instance is diagnosing what the problem is. Um, there is a whole range of different events that impact businesses at different times. It may be that it's gone through a growth phase, it's now maturing, and I know there's some information you'll look at in a minute on that. Um, and management hasn't pivoted to, to find the next best product to move back into a growth phase or hasn't, hasn't looked at where the expansions got to a point where it's no longer profitable and it's coming back to their core offering. That diagnosis and looking at whether it's a strategic issue or as some sort of natural disaster issue or just a, a, an event that's impacting them, it's a one-off event, that diagnosing the problem in the first place allows us to get to a position where we can plan to amend and, and turn that around. And then obviously implementing that plan via these four five different areas that we've looked at or that are noted here on the turnaround process um, is really the ingredients for a successful turnaround. So if we think about Napoleon Purvis, Simon um, gets appointed to that particular entity in circumstances where there's a maturing effectively of that business. And there is a position around the number of bricks and mortar stores that they had, that a, a number of them were underperforming, getting to a point where the, the overall business itself was carrying those things. There were a few other things that had happened in terms of strategic decisions that had led them to a position where they, they burnt a lot of capital. So um, their so expansion... I, I think the question here is that the industry wasn't maturing. Yeah, the, 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 the business was. was. Yeah. And the question then is why was it maturing mm -hmm. when the industry wasn't? And, and that was because there were fundamental problems in the business, in the operations, right? So you've got the operations point there, mm. where, where basically the, their investment in the US operations was, were, were, uh, didn't work out. Yeah. Um, you know, and today the new owners are running it very well, so you know, I'll, I'll, say, I'll caveat with that, with that response, but, um, but they, they had lost focus. And then as a result of that, the maturity accelerated. And so once you hit a point of maturity, then you're at an inflection point, which we'll show later in the presentation. Do I start to decline or do I, do I take a, a new direction? Do I, uh, do I, do I re-strategize my business and, and then kick on into another phase of growth? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I was going to get into there was um, the, the diagnosis at that point came back to the focus in terms of mm. management. They obviously 
as you alluded to, spent a lot of money in the US and that didn't quite work out. So their capital buffer had decreased at that point. You come back to focus on the Australian market. There's the influences of the world that are having a massive impact in terms of who's buying what particular product. If we think about the actual products themselves, we look at their top 10 products that they sold for a long, long period of time. Of those, eight of them were out of stock and weren't back in stock. So that has had an impact on the overall um, sales volume of the business. Um, and then not being able to pivot from a focus on the, the founder of the business to these potential influences that were having a, a massive impact on, on what was yeah. being purchased by that consumer class. That, that, that coupled with the, the fact that there was a whole range of retail stores that were also underperforming kind of led to the point where we were involved. And, and, and they had, uh, to their credit, uh, tried to restructure prior to administration. Mm. The extent of the restructure was too, too much to, to be doing it in a turnaround perspective and they needed the, 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 the framework of the administration process to be able to, to downsize and restructure and reset. Mm. And that's, what's happened. that's what happened. They, they cut out half their stores. They've cut out a few more since. Um, you know, this sector of the retail is very profitable. The cost of buying makeup and then selling it is, you know, it's a big difference. Yeah, um, it's huge. You know, I, think, I think something like the black eyeliner was uh, like $50. It was costing us about $3. So um, you've seen some price competition come in. You know, Sephora and Mecca, are, 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 and the product and quality is actually much better. Yeah. So again, that was all missed as a result of the fact that they were playing catch up. With the losses that they made from the from the failed investment into the US. Yeah, and look, the operational changes that came with yeah. the VA side of things, the financial impact that that had, and then obviously the legal side of things with the VA framework, it's pretty flexible for us to be able to exit leases yeah. and for us to reduce headcount and those types of things. And and like you said, um, it's now obviously under new ownership and and still bubbling away. So still training a lot. Yeah, it's um. It's one of those things that's quite interesting in you thinking about the process overall, um, what that, what can be achieved in terms of that turnaround yeah. review. And that sort of leads us into this um, section of the report, of uh, the president of the webinar, and that's, this is a diagram that um, the Turnaround Management Association promotes, and it's a very good diagram, and, also, um, and, and this gives you an idea of, what a typical business, so this is not just retail, but what does a typical business go through in its life cycle? Mm. And you know, you know, just like our firm, we're sort of in the startup to growth phase and, and we're seeing a huge start, um, you know, growth in that space, uh, helped along by a very strong insolvency market. But you know, for a retailer, it's similar. They, they will grow very well, there will be that honeymoon period, you know, provided they get through the, the hump and, the, and they impose the really strong disciplines that all good management does. They'll, they'll grow and, and they'll start to get, yeah, they'll start to grow very quickly. Um, and then the importance of that strategic advice, which is that second column there, uh, is, is essential in making sure that you're implementing your strategy, making sure that you're, you're setting timelines and goals annually and, and, and long term, making sure that if you need to refresh those goals, that you, you're doing that. The where, where it sort of starts to fall away, and as we said earlier, um, and certainly, um, that's sort of what happened in the Napoleon business is that it got mature. Now, it wasn't the industry that matured. If the industry is maturing, it's, it's a much more broader issue to face because sometimes you might have to make a more radical change and that is, do I do an overall, a whole whole basis change in my business and what I actually sell? Because if the industry is, is, going through, is shrinking and potentially disappearing, um, then, um, you know, I need to think about this differently. Yeah. But, where once it gets into a downward spiral, and, and, and you can see in this diagram here, you've got underperformance uh, in that third column. That's when you start to, to turn your mind as management into a turnaround and restructuring perspective. Um, and, the th and the four areas that the TMA focus on is strategic crisis, profitability crisis, liquidity crisis, and solvency crisis. Now, very, very, Lots of consulting words there, 
But I, I think if the strategy starts to get misaligned, starts to to not be working, and nothing is done about it, then you've got to then you'll start to see businesses mature and then to to, to decline. Because if the if there is a strategic crisis, and that is you've got the strategy wrong, you're heading in the wrong direction, and it's not working, and you're not doing anything about changing that. Mm-hmm. Now everyone makes mistakes when they set up businesses. It's how quickly you correct correct that those mistakes and get that strategy realigned to where it should be. Mm. Assuming that that doesn't happen, it then moves into the next stage of being a profitability crisis. So you start to see your margins drop. You start to see your bottom line drop, your EBITDA performance starts to fall away. And of course, you know, your free cash starts to, to, to burn. And that's how the profitability crisis, if that's not fixed very quickly, it heads straight into a liquidity crisis quite quickly. Because of course, if there's less profit, eventually it'll turn into a very a very low cash position and of course you've got less liquid you've got a liquidity crisis mm-hmm. maybe when you've got a profitability crisis and you're still well cashed up do you need to take some steps maybe an acquisition maybe doing something that will bring in and rectify the profitability you know inefficiencies in the businesses taking out headcount is the bricks and mortar uh, you know have you got the data to, to tell you if performance at, in a bricks and mortar store or even online you know there's definitely you know people people just assume that online is going to work right mm. that's not necessarily the case no it's oh uh, look there's all sorts of supply things you got to consider yeah. is it do you have a 3pl facility do you invest in the stock do you drop ship that's it right. like all of those things are come into a strategic that's right discussion and, 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 you know, and, and I suppose, that, and then just moving on to from liquidity, then if you don't if you don't move manoeuvre on those first three, you're then really heading into a solvency crisis, and that's where you know the, the discussion around your insolvency options start to come into play. You know, do I look at a voluntary administration? You know, the safe harbour process, and, and, and that's becoming a much more popular option there. Um, you know, arguably, do you start the safe harbour process? around once you're hitting a profitability i mean the, the earlier the better you know mm-hmm. safe harbor is a mechanism to protect directors from insolvent trading but it also has an indirect effect is that it gets management focused on fixing the problem and if, if you've if you've got um you know if you've got management that are not reactive not responsive it usually is a good way to shock them by entering into a safe harbour process because it gets their mind focused. Well, I know a lot of the ones that you've worked on, that that's really been the major Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's right. I mean, the, 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 the ones that I've done in recent time, um, you, you really spend a bit of time right up front saying to management, if you're not prepared to make the difficult changes, and that may include yourself moving on, and, and that has certainly happened in all of the recent ones I've done, there's been changes in management. Because mm-hmm. usually, as you know, we go back to that earlier comment we made, 90% of insolvencies are caused by poor management. So if the if there are particular people within the management team that are underperforming and actually impacting the business, and sometimes that could be the founder, sometimes they need to move on. Yeah. So there, um, that that there, there, that's sort of the the sort of the various stages that we have around turnaround. Um, yeah, you know, once if, if you get it right, um, and you know, we we've seen in some of the businesses we sold that that turnaround has been achieved. I mean, Custom Bus was whilst it's not retail, that was one where we we sold to a, 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 a better management team, yeah. a very experienced management team, and they're signing big contracts with the New South Wales government in, in the last two years. So that again, it came down to the pe- the people that were involved. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, uh, you know, uh, you know, if we go back to Napoleon Purtis, you know, that business has been taken over by very experienced retailers, and you know, it's been a hard slog, but they've they've got through, and uh, you know, hopefully, we're, we're going to see some some very good news come out of them. Um, but um, you know, it, it's important that you know the turning around of the business to to to, to, to reset themselves. And sometimes that turnaround might ne- you might need to involve a voluntary administration process. CFO is another one that went through a voluntary administration. It's now come out of that. They did the big reset through the voluntary administration. The new owners have come in, and now you know in recent time they're, they're talking about you know potentially trying to find buyers to buy the new business. Sure. Yeah, it's it's, uh, 
oh look, it, it's something that you and I get yeah. to experience every day, and and being involved in these scenarios is obviously something that we really enjoy doing because it gives a, it, I feel like it gives a, a tangible benefit at the end yeah. of the day. So just to cover off on this one, um, the, the, look, you have to look at all the different parts of the business. So so. When it comes to financial, it's all about money. Where, where can I improve, get cash? Where can I improve the working capital? Can I get external funding? Can I get private equity? Can I get related party investment? Um, you know, your, is, is, is the ask so much that I need to compromise? So that does a D to company arrangement need to be done? You know, the less popular, the less frequent one in Australia is the scheme of arrangement. Um, uh, the, the second one is, you know, can you undertake various negotiations with landlords? I think I recalled Starbucks from years ago where they where they were basically having to reduce the number of stores in Australia. There was a big effort around renegotiating terms with the landlord. Sometimes that resulted in exiting the premises. The voluntary administration makes it more brutal for the landlord because the, the, the administration process allows us to walk away from those sites and the landlord's left with a what we call an unsecured pre-appointment debt. Um, and then looking at carving out those non-core offerings, you know, what, what's not core to the business? And the core might change. If, the business, if, if you're in a sector that's declining or disappearing, as, or even disappearing, you know, do I need to reset the core, understand what the core is? And then um, you know, the final point is, do I need to think about uh, a safe harbour process? and or a restructuring strategy. And, and just to be very clear, a safe harbour process is to protect directors from insolvent trading. A restructure process is to restructure the business. So they're two different things. They usually work hand in hand, but you need to appreciate that it's not the one and the same thing. Well, again, it comes back to focusing the management team, right? Exactly. It, it's a great That's way exactly. to, to focus the management team on that restructuring process. That's and right. That's um, it's often a uh, the main outcome is refocusing the management team with that, that oversight of the safe harbour advisor. Yeah, just just to wrap things up, and thank you for those that have held on. Um, now, so what does the future look like for this this sector? And, and we, in our white paper, we, we sort of covered off on this, and so I'll touch on them now briefly. Um, you know, make sure your product is attractive and is presented well. Um, you know, can they be displayed differently? I mean, Andrew talked about using influencers like Kim Kardashian. You know, do we need to look at that, that, that how that product is presented and offered? Um, what's the competitors doing? Okay, sometimes you get the best ideas out of your competitors. You know, watch what the competitors do. Respect them. Okay, respect your competitors. Once you respect them, then you'll get you'll be able to see some of their ideas. Um, and how are you controlling your stock on hand? Okay, you know, are you doing it by consignment? Some retailers do it that way. Are you, are you, are you having to store a lot because there's huge demand in a short space of time? And you know, one of my favourite hobbies is around collecting uh, basketball shoes, right? You know, you can see that you know when there's a release of a shoe or, or something of very popular, there's a lot sold in a very short space of time. So how is it? How do you have to manage stock when the, in, in that scenario? It's particularly pertinent to retail businesses because Absolutely. that's that's your main product is your stock. That's yeah. what you're selling. It, yes, there's brand overlays that you can get premiums for, but if you're in a strategic position where you decide that, I don't know, um, bright coloured clothing's the it thing for the next season and you order a whole heap of bright coloured clothing and someone goes and says, oh, no, it's black now. Like, well, well there's a strategic yeah. issue there. Do you sit on the stock and wait for that to come back into fashion or do you liquidate it so you get some of that capital back even at a loss? So yeah. it's really one of those things that you've got to be on top of. Yeah, when it comes to retail. And look, just, just following on from that, is, is you, have you got the right workforce? Okay, workforce is a real challenge. Talent is a real challenge in every industry at the moment. Low unemployment, super low unemployment. Some of that will, will get some relief as our immigration starts to be uh, returned to normal and, and we'll have a, a short term pickup in that sense. Um, but there's a lot to, you need to be very across the training needs, the development needs of staff, and making sure that they're getting the support they need to, to, to make it a success. And, and, and then moving on to that is the range and your expanding product range. 
Now, do, how, how, how much do you want to expand? Um, do you want to keep a small group? And as I said, uh, I mean, that, that might be a small select group that's very profitable. So it's obviously the, the number of sales per day is less, but the profit achieved by that lesser number might be higher. Or do you, or, or do you see that you know, you've got short-term stints of high demand where you've got huge sales in a short space of time and then nothing in between? So understand that as well. The retail 101 side of things, I used to run my own retail business in the yeah. States. And at the end of the day, the 80-20 20 rule is always, always, yes, 80% of your sales come from 20% of your products, but again, when you're talking about how do you display those, how do you present them, that other 20% is the thing that might get someone in the door. Yeah. And it's how do you put it together so that it all works, so that your 80% is working well and your 20% is attracting those people to buy the yeah. 80%. So Absolutely. So they're walking out with more than what they're planning. Yeah, or, or yeah. they're working, walking out with, the thing that you know that you're going to sell, even though they yeah. store something fancier in the front window. Yeah. So it's, it's I call it the Costco experience. That's exactly right. <laughs> but uh, look, and finally, the omni-channel experience. Andrew alluded to touched on that in the multi-channel stuff earlier on. Um, you know, you really need to get that right, and make sure you're choosing the right ones in that sense. Um, and look, you know, just just wrapping up there. I mean, as we sort of said earlier. Um, yeah, you know, it, this is a sector we think is going to, 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 to find some challenges in the next 12 months as the, the level of discretionary spend and re, uh, is reduced and real household income is impacted. So, you know, retailers must be ready to, to innovate, to change, and the planning efficiently and reinforcing their core process is essential to that. So, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, obviously, we're happy to take any questions. There's a, a chat box there. Um, you can type your question in. So we'll sit on for a minute. If anyone has any questions, um, obviously, more than happy to answer them. It's it's interesting times for the space, and and like you suggested earlier, Simon, it's um, it the discretionary spend pressures, the interest rates, the inflation side of things is um, is going to keep working its way through the system, and I yeah. think. Over the next 12, 18 months, two years, you're going to continue to see pressure on these um, on these retailers, and and if, we, if they can think about implementing some of the tips and tricks we've obviously talked about here, and, and if they need to get into a position where they're talking to someone like us in terms of restructuring, then um, that's something that's obviously we're more than happy to accommodate. But yeah, and I think I think the main thing here too is that if you do see your, your you know, for those that have clients or those that are in the retail sector, if you are seeing uh, you know some of your uh, you know move into ensuring an underperforming space, you know reach out to people like us to to, to help you with that, um, and um, we're, we're we're happy to um, to see. Um, uh, to, to assist. I think there's a question here. Yeah, the question is, what have you seen as the hallmarks of poor management? Oh, look, I, I think I think it's it's just a lack of visibility, um, a, lot, a lack of preparation, a lack of implementing the disciplines. Um, you know, often we'll go into a business and the cash flow is not there. Um, when you ask them what's their best performing product, they don't really know. They have a, have a sense of what that is. And so it's all about the disciplines and uh, of implementing the, the fundamentals of, of, your, of, your, of what your sector expects. Um, it's constantly reviewing those yeah, things and revisiting them. Yeah, and staff turnover. I mean, leadership, poor leadership is, can, can just can infect everything. So if you've got poor leadership, and that can often be you know, the individual is very dominant and, and, and wants it done it this way and, and it's not the right direction, they're not, there's not enough listening going on. Um, I think that's. I think that. I think that. You know, if there is a, a management that is suffering from a, a dominant personality, and that dominant personality is not actually getting it right, I think we have to look at. Um, you know, making those changes, and, and certainly in a recent safe harbour, I did. Um, we there was uh, two or three changes made um, very quickly, once. Um, once a new face and, a, and the investor that came in and, 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 and realised what, what the problem was, they made that really difficult decision and, and it was the founder. Um, and it's a bit sad, but I mean, that, that's what needed to be done. Yeah, perfect. All right. Well, I think that covers everything off, Andrew. And um, thank you, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, the webinar will also be put on our website, so if you do want to listen to it later, 
uh, or have other people watch it, please uh, refer them to our website at uh, cathropartners.com.au. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, your attendance, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.